Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue the series of monthly Patreon AMA sessions this January 2022 edition. A continued discussion with the members of the School of Forbidden Text. Remember, you can join us there for as little as just $2 per month. Link to my Patreon is in the video description. So, as somebody who, in a certain sense, needs to have a new image of myself every month to put on the title slide for these AMA videos, simply for lack of anything better to put there, as uh, I can't just, you know, put the image of a book cover and other philosophy as would usually be the case, I find that um, I have to go further and further back in the archives to find images of myself because the expectation that somebody of my age or um, even more so those younger than me would have a constant supply of new selfies all the time, um, that presupposes a set of technological conditions which I've intentionally gone out of my way to negate one by one over the past few years. For example, I don't use a smartphone anymore as I intentionally downgraded to a $15 non-smart Nokia phone about two years ago. I'm also not on Instagram. After all, why do you need to take a picture of every experience in your life instantly? Unless you assume that you have an audience of hundreds, uh, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of followers that you can broadcast that pseudo experience to and get a reaction instantly. And the reaction you get from that audience of people you probably don't even know turns out to be more important than the experience itself. And this extends, by the way, even to the most sublime experiences of nature that the Earth has provided for us. Like, there was a major problem in 2019 of people traveling to Mount Everest, but then dangerously shoving each other out of the way at the very top of the peak in order to hog the spotlight to take a selfie, which they don't realize will be buried by the algorithm just 24 hours later to make room for um, pa uh, images of people's lunch at Taco Bell due to a lack of relevance. Anyone who, by the way, obsesses over news articles should realize that the uh, average lifespan of a news article is even shorter than that. It's typically like less than 24 hours. Okay, so that's what you're spending your entire life um, talking about uh, in flame wars with people you don't even know, just so we're clear on that. <laughs> but um, the, uh, the technological conditions um, that facilitate uh, constantly taking pictures of yourself, since I don't really live with those anymore, I kind of have to go back to the time in my life when I was still immersed in, say, social media. And one such year that that was really bad uh, was the year of the picture you see uh, on the screen now. This was from October of 2016. And as I sort of rediscovered this picture after not seeing it for many years, I decided that it might be a good opportunity to discuss the conditions of my life in that year that helped make me into this very unusual philosopher that you see on the channel now. For example, if you happen to discover this channel, um, through a video on like Zizek or Hegel or Aristotle, something like that, um, and you didn't know anything more about me when you first watched, you probably assumed that I was um, a leftist uh, or a communist or a Marxist um, or an SJW or a Democrat and certainly a secularist, um, just because the academic industry had taught you to assume that all of those are hard requirements to do philosophy. When you saw that I actually kind of make fun of all of those things, especially in my recent books, um, you probably wondered how exactly that came to be. Well, of course, when I was in the academic industry, I realized that I had to at least say that I was all of those things, okay? But in 2016, when I was fully out of the academic industry, as I dropped out of a PhD in 2014, and I adjuncted for only six weeks in 2015 and quit after I found out how low the pay was, how few hours, how unstable, um, and quite frankly, how bad the overall working conditions were, um, I realized that I would be better off even just working part-time at a low-wage gig like um, the kind I did before I'd even graduated um, undergrad in 2009. I used to work as a caregiver for the elderly and the disabled, and I actually found in 2016 I was better off just doing that all over again than adjuncting. And in the course of uh, working for that company in 2016, um, I dealt with a lot of, of course, elderly uh, people in, uh, say, nursing homes. I had a lot of clients over 90 years old. Um, but uh, the guy that I spent the most time with and who ended up having the greatest influence on the change that I had after leaving the academic industry was the guy you see in this picture. This guy uh, was my client that I would largely uh, drive around to various appointments within the Denver area for like some physical therapy, things like that. Um, and in the course of that year, when I was basically 
completely off the radar. I had actually deleted my um, YouTube channel also, so I was no longer making videos and sharing publicly what my opinion on various things uh, was, at least in that regard. Um, I found that I was free to open my mind up to things that would have been uh, totally unthinkable when I was in the academic industry and or when I was on YouTube and I, I had to publicly share what my opinions everything was. And um, the guy you see in the picture was a major influence in getting me to open up my mind about those things because uh, the guy in the picture was a, a Pentecostal Christian and also a, you know, quote unquote, black Republican. And um, he was somebody who uh, got me to realize that as much as you have this negative stereotypical image of, say, uh, conservative ideas or Christianity, especially the kind of fundamentalist Protestantism, um, when you are in uh, the academic industry, if you actually spend time directly with those things, I found that I actually liked them better. This is the same thing which uh, Jordan Peterson had mentioned um, in his youth. He liked the ideas of leftists, like, you know, the very clear and simple explanation that all the problems in the world are caused by people not being rich enough. Let's just say as it is. Um, the, uh, the euphemisms of uh, material conditions determining ideology, etc. It's just a euphemism for saying if everybody had more money, they wouldn't be unhappy. Except, of course, for all of the very wealthy people that still have all kinds of personal problems. If you listen to the um, tapes of Mel Gibson um, um, uh, uh, shouting at uh, his mistress or whatever in 2009, not to pick on Mel Gibson as somebody I do respect, but you'll see that no matter how no matter how wealthy, famous you might be, um, th you will still probably have some problems in your life that can't be solved by that alone. And um, Peterson mentioned that. Um, he liked the ideas of the leftist movement, but when he went to the meetings, he didn't actually like the leftists that he dealt with because they tended to all have an explanation for why they weren't able to accomplish anything at the present moment. Well, we have to uh, have a revolution against the entire system. Until that happens, I can't accomplish anything. And he found that um, even though he didn't like the ideas necessarily in the abstract of the uh, conservative movement, if he actually went to the meetings and saw the people at the meetings, he tended to like them because they were actually doing something. They didn't feel like they were held back by the the, the capitalist mode of production or whatever. The, uh, we're waiting for a global revolution. Until that happens, I can't do anything. Um, and I kind of had the same experience myself. I um, liked the simple explanations of, you know, communism back when I was in graduate school. Um, I just didn't like the um, experience of actually um, uh, dealing with SJWs on college campuses, <laughs> as um, provided m uh, a lot of material in my books for just how ridiculous um, the, the, the behavior of such people had become. Um, but I actually did like um, the experience of uh, dealing with uh, people like the guy in the video or, you know, the folks at his church. I hadn't gone to a church in many, many years, but one of the things I um, needed to do as his care provider was to take him to his Pentecostal church. And uh, by the end of the year, I'd shifted from a secularist um, of the Richard Dawkins variety to somebody who was secretly listening to people like uh, Ken Hoven and Ken Ham. Not saying I necessarily agree with them, but I realized that even just listening to uh, you know fundamentalist pastors on the radio, obscure figures in the Denver area who would just upload their uh, church sermons to the radio, um, I actually liked listening to these guys a lot more than your average SJW, like say on TYT. So um, the uh, question really becomes whether you will do something you don't like simply because you feel like you have to, simply because you're part of this institution in which it's not enough to have knowledge of Hegel, Aristotle, or Zizek. You have to also have the right views on these other matters, even in the point now where the person being hired for the tenure track position probably doesn't know anything about Hegel, Zizek, or Aristotle because they don't need to because their political activism has, you know, already given them the, uh, the, the pass to get to the front of the line to get the job, which uh, those who uh, continue um, investing hour after hour and actually learning philosophy will never get. And the question is whether you will um, go through the motions of doing that, even if you don't actually enjoy it. This is something I, I was able to think about in 2016 when I was no longer in the academic industry. I was no longer on YouTube. Nobody knew what I was doing. So I was able to do things in secret simply because I liked them better. And that turned out to be uh, 
uh, listening to a, a lot of um, conservative talk radio in the car while I was driving this guy around. He said himself he used to uh, listen to uh, the talk shows like by Laura Ingram and people like that for like eight hours a day when he was driving as a courier himself um, before, uh, of course, he was no longer able to. And uh, I, I found it listening to, in listening to people like Laura Ingram, I actually agreed with her more than the TYT people, even though in a certain sense I knew that uh, the views she was expressing were not allowed, they were forbidden, but I actually liked them more. And um, it's ironic that the, the same people who would fall back on Freud to justify them as saying, well, we're no longer living in the age of repression, we're living in the age of do what you want. Right? This is Aleister Crowley's profound philosophy. If you watch a documentary on him, um, they were introducing his philosophy as, we're going to undo all repression. If you want to do something, do it. And you know, people in the comment section of a religious background say, oh wow, what a profound philosophy. Do what you want, as though nobody's ever thought of that before. What's well, interesting, that the, uh, the, the people in the uh, academic industry basically have the same idea. We're, we're using Freud to say, no more repression. If you want to do something, do it. Unless it's, of course, um, the enjoyment you actually get from listening to people where we've concluded you're not allowed to listen to. So it's quite an irony, but I just thought I would uh, mention this interesting um, uh, turn of events within my own life, going from, in late 2015, uh, registering at the uh, uh, voter registry office in Denver as a, a communist. There's a little old lady sitting at the, uh, the the table asking my registration. I said, I'm a communist. She said, what? I said, yes, ma'am, I'm a communist. She said, well, we don't have that party. I'll just put you down as a Democrat. Uh, less than a year later, I re-registered as a libertarian, okay, because I liked listening to, say, Alex Jones and, and people like that more than TYT, even though I knew in a certain sense I wasn't allowed to listen to them. So uh, once again, thank you, everybody, for supporting the channel. We'll go ahead and move on now to the first question. All right, so the next question is a very closely related. The question is, hey, Chad, I'm glad to see that you are a Christian. My question is, how do you reconcile your belief and still have an affinity for the incredible Shrinking Son of Man by Robert M. Price? Well, if you don't know Robert M. Price, he is a mythicist New Testament scholar and one of the only mythicists in the world with a PhD. Now, what is a mythicist? A mythicist is somebody who argues for the the extreme stance that um, Jesus never existed, okay? So there are other skeptical New Testament scholars like, say, Bart Ehrman, who will probably say something like, the vast majority of things we think about Jesus are actually not historical, but he would not go as far as to say that the guy never existed. One of the only people who holds that position, but also holds a quote-unquote respectable academic background is Robert M. Price. I found out about him myself after reading uh, Bart Ehrman's uh, book, Did Jesus Really Exist? Something like that, in which he tackled the mythicist phenomenon, um, but um, found that the vast majority of mythicist publications out there were of so poor a quality and by so unqualified uh, writers from Ehrman's own perspective um, that they weren't even worth uh, dealing with except to uh, he took two really bad examples and just listed out all of the historical inaccuracies within a book that was supposed to be exposing the historical inaccuracies of the New Testament. It's quite an irony, but he noted that the people who wrote these uh, two books um, were um, not New Testament scholars. Um, they were, I think one of them had a bachelor's degree in classics, so you know, the person spoke Greek and Latin and whatever, um, and that's you know, great, but uh, this person was not um, actually of an academic background in the sense that uh, Ehrman would uh, consider necessary to be able to uh, begin publishing on something like this. The only exception at that time, anyway, was Robert M. Price, who does have a PhD um, and uh, was a, not always a mythicist. He was actually um, originally a Baptist pastor. He's uh, born in Jackson, Mississippi, and he had been a, I guess, a, a more or less conservative Baptist pastor. Um, he claims now that he was never a fundamentalist who believes the Bible to be the inerrant, uh, you know, word of God to be interpreted literally word for word. Um, but uh, still, he was, you know, a pastor before he was a mythicist. So at the very least, we can conclude that there was a time in his life when he um, believe that Jesus had existed. Um, and even in the incredible shrinking set of man, um, you don't find the full-blown mythicist perspective. This is a kind of early-ish work of Price um, that uh, argues that um, if you strip away one historical inaccuracy from the New Testament at a time, uh, by the time you go through the entire, um, you know, text, 
um, all you'll really have left is a name. You'll have the name Jesus, but at that point, he's become so small that although he's technically still there, he's basically disappeared. And that is the argument of that book. A much more extreme text, of course, is um, the Christ myth theory and its problems, which I also read um, about the same time I read uh, Incredible Shrinking Son of Man, in which he argues that um, Jesus himself didn't exist because all of the stories in the New Testament about Jesus actually began as um, um, commentaries on passages from the Old Testament, which were later misinterpreted by some other people um, as uh, literal historical accounts of a particular, the life of a particular guy named Jesus of Nazareth. So he shows very impressively um, that pretty much every story about Jesus in the New Testament can be correlated one by one with a passage in the Old Testament. Now, of course, the fundamentalist response, um, or at the very least the response of a believer, would be, well, yeah, of course you can correlate one by one from Old Testament to New Testament because the Old Testament is predicting the episodes of the life of Jesus in the New Testament. And that's probably what Price himself used to believe. I suspect strongly that his knowledge of these parallels between Old and New Testament stems from the time when he was a pastor and he was interpreting these as prophecy, but um, with the same knowledge but a different um, hermeneutical prejudice in his later mythicist years, he changed his mind to say, no, 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 these were um, um, commentaries on the Old Testament in a certain style uh, that was uh, popular in uh, early, um, let's just say, uh, first century AD, etc., uh, Jewish scholarship. I think it's called Mishra something. I forget the exact term. Um, you could probably list in the comments what exactly it is. But uh, he says, no, it, this is just um, an analysis of the text that was misrecognized later as a literal account of a person's life who he claims did not really exist. So um, the, uh, the question, uh, how do you work with the same data but reach a radically different conclusion simply because you bring a different hermeneutical prejudice to the same data? I think you could definitely um, it, it dwell on that question along with Robin M. Price, but the question which the AMA um, um, the uh, the uh, patron is asking for this AMA session is how do I, as somebody who um, openly identifies as a conservative Protestant Christian and a member of Pentecostal Church since 2017, although I started attending in 2016 with uh, my client you saw on the first slide, um, so as somebody who's uh, been in a certain sense in that church for six years, how do I have an interest in Robert M. Price instead of simply condemning him as so dangerous as to not even worth reading? If you look at the Amazon reviews of skeptical New Testament scholars like, say, Howard M. Teeple, who was actually the first one I uh, got into uh, even before Bartram and I read uh, Howard M. Teeple's um, How Did Christianity Really Begin, a work, I think, from the 1980s, which is long since out of print. I don't even think you can easily find a copy of it anymore, but in the comments section of that text, I would see believers write things like, um, don't follow Howard Teeple into hell. If you read this book and lose your faith, it's not worth it because, um, you know, you'll, you'll, um, you'll learn certain things about history, but you'll lose your soul in the process, so it's not a good deal. That's how some people um, interpret, um, or that's how some people uh, feel about the experience of even dabbling in skeptical literature. But for me, the grand irony was I was only completely sold on joining the church after I started studying um, Robert M. Price and uh, Bart Ehrman, okay? So I was uh, attending, in a certain sense, with uh, my client um, in 2016 as somebody who was only accompanying him, not really as a member. I only uh, joined uh, formally in 2017 at the exact same time I was reading heavily into a Barterman. I read every Barterman book at the local library in Denver. Must have been like eight or nine books by Bart Ehrman, and I read uh, three books by uh, Price. Uh, these two, and then also his book on uh, the Apostle Paul. So the irony for me was that the skeptical New Testament scholars um, did not cause me to call into question the um, even historicity of the books, as was their goal. Rather, they showed me how fascinating the New Testament is as a text, which I never would have given credit to when I was still a secularist um, in the academic industry in, say, 2014. My um, response to the Bible at that time was, ah, you know, it's a, uh, a book by Bronze Age goat herders, which certainly uh, nobody could 
you know, uh, have anything to learn from today after we've made so many advances in science and blah, blah, blah. Um, well, that Richard Dawkins caricature misses the point that the Bible is an incredibly fascinating text, which um, Robert M. Price himself had noted at the beginning of Incredible Shrinking Son of Man. Um, you don't even have to be a believer to find the text fascinating to study on its own terms. It's kind of like people who get into, um, say, scholarship on uh, Homer, I think is his own example, or, um, you know, the, the works of uh, Aristotle or Dante or Cervantes or Shakespeare. These are interesting texts to study simply because they're interesting texts to study. And um, I guess when I found out how many um, interesting uh, passages there are, how many um, um, theological points being made by, say, Paul, that to this day nobody really understands what he's talking about. It's incredibly difficult to read Paul, such that um, Ehrman noted as somebody who's not an expert on Paul, who'd rather spend his entire life on the New Testament, uh, the, uh, the Gospels, I should say, noted that um, you could um, spend uh, an entire lifetime trying to understand Paul, and it would be even more difficult than the, the, uh, the Gospels, okay? So you have a very intellectually stimulating and philosophically sophisticated um, ideas, okay, in these texts, which... In a certain sense, when you, for me, when you see just how much there is in those texts, um, which maybe even the average uh, believer who simply accepts it without thinking critically about it might not even perhaps realize. It's rather these skeptics who are working with an agenda to try to deconstruct it, who are able to um, notice all of the uh, complications in the text, largely to try and show you inconsistencies, things like that. But um, it's still in the process. They, they notice things which maybe somebody who believes in it too much will simply gloss over, okay? Because they already know what their pastor or priest told them that passage means. They don't need to necessarily think about it anymore. The skeptic actually brings out just how complicated it is. And that's really, in a certain sense, made... Um, uh, joining Christianity, something that was actually intellectually interesting for me. And, of course, that was not the only reason I joined and have been a member since, but uh, ironically, it played a part. So if, if Robert M. Price knew <laughs> that um, his mythicist work had created a believer rather than um, destroyed belief for someone, I don't know how he would react to that, but uh, it is kind of an interesting irony nonetheless. All right, so the next question in the AMA session is, hey, Chad, you know, I was just realizing how much effort you actually put into the slides of your presentations, including finding all of that specific stock art. Like, even going through something simple, like that second lecture on Wheelox Latin, there's a ton to type out there. I was wondering how many hours a day you put into composing your videos, specifically the PowerPoint part of it, not the reading of the text themselves, uh, but assuming you're healthy and not sick and able to do that. So, of course, um, past week I had a slight delay in videos because because I was minorly sick with something, although to this day I don't know what it was. It was not the common cold, it was not the flu, I recognized those symptoms very well. It was rather um, just a few days of a minor fever um, and a loss of uh, taste and smell. And of course, your first reaction would be to assume that it's you know what. And of course, that would make even more sense considering that uh, just you know, two weeks ago, three of my wife's co-workers at the college had to miss work after testing positive for you-know-what, so we assumed it was that, but when we got tested, it came back negative for both me and my wife, so it's an interesting year, the past year, in which um, I've noticed getting sick more often, and with things I don't even know what they are, but of course on this channel I do not offer advice in any way, shape, or form whatsoever, I just thought I would anecdotally mention some of the context for this question. So if we get to the question itself, um, regarding how much work goes into producing a single video, the short answer is quite a lot. And there is a lot to type out, and even more so, there's a lot to write out. A lot of um, the work to produce these videos actually goes on um, with a physical notebook. I, I used to um, type out everything on the slides, say, a year ago. Um, and I instead switched over to using a physical notebook so I could try to minimize the amount of time that the computer is on, even though the computer is not connected to Wi-Fi. 
okay, the, the computer, uh, so I no longer use a smartphone, and the computer itself has no Wi-Fi connection, because I found that that is the only way to get this much work done. Um, I typically wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning uh, and start work right away, say 5.30 after I, you know, able to make some coffee, um, and I pretty much work throughout the entire day. Okay, and um, I, I'm certainly working more than I did when I was, say, doing 40 hours a week, okay, uh, because I have no days off. I do some work every day unless I'm sick, or if I'm, like, when I was traveling in Delhi and Uttar Pradesh a few months ago, that's an exception, but otherwise I pretty much work every day, okay. And um, the, the question, how are you able to do that? I think I'd provide the same answer as uh, John Michael Greer. Somebody asked him, you know, how are you able to write so many books? He said, well, it's easy. I don't have a television. <laughs> uh, if you don't spend six hours a day watching TV, as the average person unfortunately does, um, you have a lot of time. That's six hours to do something else. And uh, I think it's even worse with social media because I, I, I don't even think people spend six hours a day on their smartphone. It's like... Um, however many hours they're awake is when they're on their smartphone, okay? If you wake up, um, if you sleep eight hours a day, then you're awake for, what, 16 hours a day. So it's more like people are spending 16 hours a day on their smartphone. If you have gone to a gas station in America in recent years and tried to get help with anything um, and been frustrated to find that the, uh, the young girl working over the counter or guy um, won't even look up from their smartphone um, when you're trying to, say, uh, you know, pay for your gasoline, even though that's, a, that's their job, that's the kind of country it's become. So if you're not spending 16 hours a day on a smartphone or on internet, and if the internet use you do have typically involves just checking Discord or uh, YouTube comments, email, things like that, I don't really follow um, the, uh, the kind of things that end up wasting so much of a person's time, like say, social media. It's been a long time since I've been on that. I do have a Twitter account, but I tweet only maybe once a year or something like that. Um, so the, um, the, the question of time, I think, um, is not so much the emphasis here, because we all have time. The question is rather, how much time do you have left over after you subtract the amount that goes into television and social media. And if you don't have those things, it's actually quite a lot. I remember working as a care provider originally back in 2009. I used to have to work 48 hour shifts with a guy who was like 97 years old and he was asleep the vast majority of the time. So obviously we would do, I would do the things I had to do. I would make food for the guy. I would clean the house. I'd drive him to appointments, whatever. Um, but there was a lot of time in that 48 hours that he was just knocked out asleep in his chair. And um, there was uh, no internet connection um, in that house, and by the way, I didn't have a smartphone in 2009 anyway, so I found I was able to read an enormous number of texts while I was at work. Um, like uh, Hinori de Balzac's Cousin Bet in 2009, I read uh, 400 pages in, you know, one day basically, and I found that I actually preferred being at that guy's house with no internet and no TV to being in my own house where I had internet and I had television and the books that I would have preferred reading I just felt like I couldn't read in my house because given the choice between internet and that, well, you can't not use the internet, right? So I kind of tried to intentionally recreate those conditions with uh, my house in the village. There's no Wi-Fi connection there, no television in the house, etc. So you can do a lot uh, with... Um, Stuff that's, in the long term, much better for your mind, will make you feel much better. You spend the same amount of time going through a fascinating text, like, um, and of course, learning a language. But is it a lot of work to make these videos? Absolutely. Okay. But it's work which, uh, it's time which would have been spent if I wasn't doing it on the videos, on something that would have been far less productive and actually far less enjoyable. It's actually a lot more fun to go through a really difficult text like uh, Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit than it is to just find, you know, what's, uh, you know, what's trending on uh, TYT, okay? <laughs> so, um, yeah, once again, the uh, short answer is just to make a 30-minute video, you have to spend hours and hours, especially if it's um, you know, a difficult philosophical text like the Hegel videos. Each one of them is about 20 minutes long, maybe 30 minutes, but you have to spend a, pretty much the whole day, um, a few days in a row, just to produce that 30 minute video. You gotta go through the text multiple times, you gotta consult secondary literature, you gotta write out your own understanding of the text and then revise that to make sure that you've caught everything. It is a lot of work, but 
of course, we already spend a lot of time on other things that really don't deserve it. So that is a great question. Thank you very much. And we'll move on now to the next one. All right, so the next question is uh, very closely related. This is a question uh, asking whether anybody within the Discord has tips on note-taking or annotating while reading a text in general. He says, I know Chad had talked about how he takes notes in his last AMA session, but that seemed to be more um, geared towards how do you make a video uh, about a book. Um, um, this person is asking more about wanting to read Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, but not knowing how one should engage with the book and the YouTube videos. In response, Telos Bound, great YouTube uh, philosophy channel, uh, mentioned, here's a few things I do. Um, this include using a pencil to underline everything significant, using sticky notes of different colors, um, I guess, to mark down pages within the book. For some books, uh, he uses many different colors, I guess, because there's a lot of different themes going on there. Um, for others, it's just two colors, one for the interesting passages or quotes, and the other for stuff not fully understood, which I guess you come back to later to fully grasp. You can also write a very brief summary or even just a list of central concepts of the content at the final page of every chapter. Um, and then you can also write down interesting or significant ideas or terms at the side or top part of pages. So um, whereas last time I had talked about how do you make videos for YouTube on philosophy, this time I'm going to um, instead uh, address the question of how do you take Phenomenology of Spirit, one of the most difficult books, not only in philosophy, but in our this is one of the most difficult books to read because um, it is not simply developing linearly one consistent line of thought by building on foundations and then deriving ever more complicated results. That is what you do have going on in, say, mathematical treatises, which are difficult, like uh, Euclid's Elements, um, uh, Principia Mathematica by Bertrand Russell is kind of doing the same thing. So those are difficult texts, but Phenomenology of Spirit is a difficult text for a different reason, and that is you're constantly revolutionizing your deepest presupposition. So you're not linearly deriving ever more complicated results from the same foundations, you're always changing the foundations. And you're not doing it in a postmodernist, deconstructivist manner that requires you to forget everything that came before. It's rather a dialectical manner in which you are revolutionizing and negating, but you're also preserving. So you have to remember a lot of things while reading Phenomenology of Spirit. By the final section on Absolute Knowing, you pretty well have to remember the entire book. But even reading the book on a paragraph by paragraph level is so difficult that how on earth can you remember everything you read by the time you get to the very end of a book that's hundreds of pages long? So I think that this is something which will serve as a, a great um, example of kind of the ceiling of the difficulty of this process. So if you're able to do it with Phenomenology of Spirit, you can certainly do it with a less difficult text in the history of philosophy. And of course, any good philosophy is still going to be difficult intrinsically because it'll make you think. And real thinking is difficult. I mentioned uh, one of my philosophy professors uh, from the old school. He was, um, you know, uh, he, he went to undergrad in the 1960s, okay? And he certainly um, had passed away by the time I'm talking, talking now, um, not making light of that, of course. I'm just saying the guy was from a, a, an era so long ago that people of his generation over the coming years will simply cease to exist. And um, they will be, they are being pre replaced by professors who don't really believe in things like reading books anymore because you can sell a lot more student loans if the course is so easy that nobody can fail it. <laughs> Unless, of course, they say something other than the Democrat Party talking points when you're discussing controversial political issues in class. But be that as it may, if we get back to the idea of, of reading um, this professor from the 1960s, recommended reading a philosophical text three times. He said, the first time you just read for general ideas. The second time you uh, read for details. And the third time you read for um, determining whether your opinion agrees or disagrees with the one put forth in the book. Okay, And to the student in undergrad who says, well, that's a lot of work. He responded, yes, it is a lot of work because real thinking is a lot of work. Okay, but the question of working smarter rather than harder, I think, is particularly relevant with regard to phenomenology of spirit because um, it is too easy to spend way too much time just trying to deal with the long sentences and obscure vocabulary, whereas you could actually <laughs> spend less time than that and grasp the full idea of what's going on, to the extent that that's even possible with someone like Hegel, if you know in advance what each section is about. And I 
mention in my own response within the Discord that um, the phenomenology of spirit is virtually impossible to read without some sort of cheat sheet telling you what each section is about. The point of the 40 video lecture series available on my channel over this text that, you know, with the exception of the preface and introduction, which we will get to soon, goes through the entire book on a paragraph by paragraph level, basically, um, in order to show you in advance, uh, before you read the text yourself, what the big idea is. So in a sense, certainty, of course, the big idea is you want immediate knowledge, but that means here and now, but here and now are not immediate. They're mediated by universal concepts okay that's the big idea okay if you have that you can pretty well read that first section and i do that with each of them um because hegel's difficulty is that he often references very obscure figures um he, he makes obscure references to historical philosophical figures etc without explicitly naming them so uh the section on faust pleasure and necessity i don't believe he uses the the, the name faust anywhere in that passage, but that's exactly what it's about. Well, if you don't know that, you'll probably miss the entire point because, you know, it's pretty important to know that this was a story of a guy who sold his soul to Satan in, ex in exchange for pleasure. In the 1926 silent film, he literally sells his soul to Satan in order to have sex with the most beautiful woman in Italy who um, had been, you know, uh, stolen uh, from her uh, husband on, at their wedding ceremony um, by a dark power beyond her own control. Uh, but in the 1926 film, um, when they reach the bedroom, um, uh, Mephisto shows Faust that his 24-hour free trial is about to run out. He's only got, like, you know, seconds left in the hourglass before the sand completely runs out. And he says, well, you know, after that happens, you certainly can stay here, but uh, you're going to go back to being an old man. He'd been given the uh, gift of youth in his free trial to see if he enjoyed it having it and uh, you know there was an understanding between the two of them that um the real reason he signed the dotted line in blood for eternity was because he didn't know if he might have some performance issues as an old man and he didn't want to embarrass himself with uh, you know the most beautiful woman in europe at that time by not being able to uh, get it up on demand so he literally sold his soul in exchange for one more erection a grand irony, of course, which Hegel himself also loves to dwell on. The whole the thing you see recurring within Phenomenology of Spirit is ironies like that. But of course, if you don't know that he's talking about Faust, you'll miss exactly that irony. You see this over and over again within the Phenomenology of Spirit, um, talking about figures that you have to bring that background knowledge to without actually telling you who it is. I don't know why Hegel did that. Maybe he was trying to get away from the picture thinking um, that, you know, you might fall into if, if you just s shout out blatantly that this is about Faust. He's trying to get away from picture thinking, notional thinking, but still, I think um, it uh, will make you work too hard and um, too long to try to understand what's going on, um, whereas if, if you don't have that information, whereas you can work smarter rather than harder if you have a cheat sheet telling you. So my advice for reading and annotating Phenomenology of Spirit in particular is to watch each video before you read each corresponding section. Now, do you need to do that with every philosophical text? Um, Aristotle, uh, Plato, uh, Kant. Um, and will that spoil the plot for you? Well, the question of whether knowing what the text is about before you read it might spoil it for you, I think, assumes that you're talking about the kind of narrative which, say, Avengers Endgame was. There was um, a news story in uh, summer 2019 about a, um, a movie theater in um, Hong Kong, I think, where a guy just got out of watching Avengers Endgame on opening day, and he saw the people standing in line to watch the next showing. And he decided to tell all of them what the climax of the movie was. The people waiting in line got so angry that they literally beat this guy because he ruined the movie for them. Okay? This is why, um, spoiler alert, uh, videos on YouTube have to explicitly say that before they, you know, before uh, the video starts. You have to explicitly say that there's spoilers before somebody agrees to watch it. So the question is, is it spoiling the plot if we tell you what Aristotle and Plato are about before you read them? Well. The difference really, I think, uh, comes down to the genres of writing that you have there. I did a video called How to Write a Philosophy Book last summer, I think, in which I mentioned that um, a lot of what we think about writing um, from our high school English 
teachers really is only uh, applicable to one genre, which is the college essay. Okay. Most writing is not like that. Um, for example, in a college essay, you have three supporting paragraphs, supporting a thesis put forth in the first paragraph, and then a conclusion which basically summarizes but says something new. Okay. A very easy form of writing, by the way. But um, newspaper articles are not like that. In newspaper articles, you put all of the really interesting information at the very beginning because most people are not going to read beyond the first paragraph, and then you sort of fill out the last few paragraphs with interviews by so-called experts to give the extra information for the percentage of people who care enough to stick around that long. Um, with a narrative, it's also different from uh, either of those genres. You have a beginning, a middle, and an end in which ordinary world is disrupted by a crisis at the beginning. In a lot of ways, you have a protagonist and an adversary who both want the same thing and only one of them can have it. Um, you think of, for example, um, you know, uh, love triangle uh, movies, you know, two men in love with the same girl, they both can't have her, whatever. Um, and then you have uh, a climax and then a resolution in which the problem is solved and then you basically go back to ordinary world. If that's the case, the question of how the problem is solved um, is a really big deal because if you already know in advance how the problem is solved, there's no point in watching the movie. I mentioned that um, Demi Moore's 1994 whatever um, film Striptease in which she was the highest paid actress in Hollywood uh, history at that time uh, for the worst film ever made, largely because they just paid her to take off her clothes, which by the way was not even the first for her. The Wikipedia article mentioned that Demi Moore had exposed her breasts in five films before that, but some genius figured if we pay her to do it again, we can um, get around irrelevant BS like actually having a good plot line because people will pay just to, you know, see more. <laughs> they'll, they'll pay to see the film if we just solve the problem by throwing more boobs at it, basically is how they were um, thinking. Um, and in their fixation on uh, senseless nudity for its own sake, they missed the properly narratological point that in a murder mystery film, you have to wait the entire movie to see who the villain is, but they um, exposed too much <laughs> um, in both senses of the term by also revealing the identity of the villain at the very beginning of the movie. So you don't even really have a functional plot at that point because you already know in a certain sense how the problem is going to be solved. We know who did the crime. Um, and that is something which will ruin the experience of following a narrative. The question is whether philosophy follows that same logic, and the answer really is no. I mentioned in the book How to Write a Philosophy Book that with philosophy, you're basically putting forth an abstract th general thesis at the beginning, and you're refining it into finer and finer supporting, uh, explicating, instantiating details over the course of the text. You look at, say, Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. The thesis you find very early on is something along the lines of you don't experience the thing in itself because what you experience is mediated by these subjective filters like space and time and category and and rational idea and things like that. And you have a very general idea of that thesis. You don't experience the thing in itself like very from the very beginning. It's just refined into finer and finer and finer details, even to the point that, you know, at a certain point, no one really knows what's going on, <laughs> right? Um, and, and that is how philosophy works. So in a certain sense, revealing the general idea at the beginning is a, a hard hermeneutical requirement to be able to read the text. It is not at all the same as revealing the climax of a film, okay? It's not really a spoiler, it's rather something you have to know in order to be able to read it because the hermeneutical procedure of refining an abstract thesis into finer and finer details is simply different from the hermeneutical experience of wondering how a problem is going to be solved within a narrative, and a lot of the fun of murder mystery is guessing, okay? Was the murderer the maid? Was the murderer, you know, the uh, uh, such and other people within the game Clue, which I've actually never played, but, you know, there's a lot of other characters. Um, which one, who done it, right? Well, in uh, Demi Moore's striptease, they reveal at the very beginning who done it because the only point of the movie is to reveal <laughs> uh, Demi Moore's body um, and that's at that point no longer even art it's rather just really really bad um, softcore pornography which is why it was the worst film ever made and ironically something which uh, R Roger Ebert noted um, the problem with the movie is not it is not that it's too sexy it's rather that it actually fails to be sexy at all despite devoting all of its energy to that one uh, thing. So, at any rate, I hope this helps. Um, 
And we'll move on now to the final question, which is, has anyone looked at Chris Dorner's manifesto as a philosophical text? I admit I can't quite remember who that is. Um, I have a feeling it's someone very, very controversial. Um, but uh, I, I'll uh, try to do some more research and see if anybody else in the comment section has any feelings on this. Uh, you know, it, it, any text, no matter how controversial, if it's interesting philosophically, it's something I'm willing to engage with um, on the channel. But uh, I, I just need a little more information about who this is uh, uh, before I can say whether I agree that this is a philosophical text. So I'll try to um, do a follow-up on that. Anyway, thanks, everybody. It's been a lot of fun.